Happy Monday, and welcome back to the Lorden Arts channel. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here today. Case Cracked is the show where we look into a mystery and what are the critical pieces that help solve that mystery. Today's case is about the Huntington Beach Jane Doe and a missing confession. On March 14th, 1968, Three boys playing in a field near Huntington Beach in California were startled by what they thought at first was a scarecrow or a mannequin. As they drew closer, they quickly realized that it was a body. Police were called, and when they arrived, they found the body of a young woman dressed in a floral print blouse with a black plastic jacket, purple capri pants, loafers, and a costume jewelry ring with a large stone. Her throat had been cut. Huntington Beach investigators found little in the way of evidence, but from tire tracks they found, they theorized that she had been dumped from the passenger side of a vehicle into the field. Unfortunately, it had rained the night before, and the tracks were too degraded to help identify the vehicle. It also appeared her killer smoked a cigarette. The cigarette butt was bagged and stored. Jane Doe's bloody clothes were carefully examined and also stored as evidence. An autopsy would determine that she was in her 20s and that she had also been severely beaten. From the condition of her body, it was thought that she was killed just hours before she was found. Unfortunately, she had also been sexually assaulted. The medical examiner took samples for a sexual assault kit. Despite extensive interviews with people seen in the area, as well as businesses nearby, no one could be found to identify the woman. All of the usual avenues were pursued. The press was brought in and composite sketches were distributed, but no one could tell them anything more about this Huntington Beach Jane Doe. Soon, there were no more tips to follow, no more avenues to pursue. Jane Doe would be buried in an unmarked grave in Newport Beach, and she would become known as Orange County's longest running Jane Doe case. Her file was taken out and reworked throughout the decades, Different composites were drawn, but nothing new ever turned up, and both murderer and murdered remained unidentified. That was until DNA analysis became an integral part of police investigations. In 2001, DNA taken from the sexual assault kit and the victim's clothes was developed and defined a male DNA profile. Unfortunately, no immediate matches to the profile could be found. The DNA profile and Jane Doe's fingerprints and dental charts were also entered into the FBI's Combined DNA Index System, or CODIS. Still, no match was found. In 2010, the cigarette butt was tested and showed a male profile that matched the profile taken from the victim's clothes and sexual assault kit, but it still could not be matched to anyone in a known database it would take another 10 years of innovation for the tools needed to crack this case. Genetic genealogy was the next step in Jane Doe's investigation. With the help of forensic genealogist Colleen Fitzpatrick and Identifinders International, they were finally able to find a match to the murderer's DNA profile. In March of 2020, he was identified as a man named Johnny Crisco. Investigators found a lot in Johnny Crisco's past that today would raise many red flags. When he was 17, Johnny entered the army after being convicted of statutory rape, but was discharged three years later. His psychological exam showed that he had a pattern of being quick to anger, easy to feel unjustly treated, chronically resentful, immature, and impulsive. Although he was classified as a Vietnam veteran, he only made it as far as Fort Bragg in North Carolina. It was found that he constantly bragged about his fictitious time in the Army's airborne forces in Vietnam. He was also found by people close to him to be very controlling and an alcoholic. In 1972, Crisco was involved in a drunk driving accident. In the decades that followed, he worked as a car mechanic and bouncer before finding more stable work at a concrete plant as a maintenance worker. One of his ex-wives stated that Crisco was injured during a fire at the concrete plant when a piece of ceiling fell, cutting one of his eyes. In the ensuing doctor's examination, it was found that in his past, Crisco had suffered a stroke or brain damage of some kind. 
She also stated that Crisco had physically abused her during their time together and afterward, threatening to kill her, her children, and her family by mail bomb and then by setting their houses on fire. He moved up the West Coast and settled in Washington State, but investigators still had no idea how he knew their Jane Doe or who their Jane Doe was. Quote, We have no doubt that he was our guy, said David Deerking, an investigator from the Orange County District Attorney's Office. With the only avenue to find the truth seeming like a direct interrogation, the investigation hit a wall. Crisco died of throat cancer back in 2015. After his death, his remains were left unclaimed by family, but he was eventually buried with veterans' honors at the Tahoma National Cemetery in Kent, Washington. Thankfully, in June of 2020, a DNA match was finally found for Jane Doe. After 52 years, her name was found to be Anita Louise Pateau, and she still had two living sisters, a brother, and many other relatives living on the East Coast. In 1968, Anita was 26 years old and one of seven children who grew up in Augusta, Maine. Her family stated that Anita had always been adventurous and longed to see other parts of the United States. She finally decided to explore the West Coast and Hollywood before returning to her hometown. In February of 1968, she had been gone about 11 months when her mother received a letter and a postcard from Anita. In them, she said that she had visited Hollywood and taken a tour of Star's homes. She also said that she had found work as a waitress and would be coming home in May. I'll see you then. Love you. Talk to you soon. And she was never heard from again. In the months that followed, her family knew something terrible had happened to her or they would have heard from her. Since then, her family has always talked of Anita and what may have happened to her. Every time the phone rang at her grandmother's house, she would always say, I hope it's Anita. Finding out the truth and the brutality she suffered came as a shock to everyone. Her sisters, brother, and niece have looked for her through the years, but were unable financially to fly to the West Coast to investigate for themselves. Her niece, Lori Quirion, regularly called the American Red Cross, the U.S. Social Security Administration, and police in California trying to find any trace of Anita. When news of investigators' discovery reached Anita's family, Quirion said that, quote, is, it's amazing. It's a number of different things. I'm so glad that she's here and that we found her. It's a big weight lifted off. Sonny Martins was 10 years old when he and his friends found Anita. He said that he's relieved for her family, but is very disappointed that her killer cannot be brought to justice. We always kept tabs on them and were wondering, Martin said. It was always such a tragic thing, not knowing who it was. I'd really love to know what happened myself. On July 18th, 2020, investigators from the Huntington Beach Police Department and the District Attorney's Office brought Anita home to her family so that a memorial service could be held before she was interned next to her sister, at a cemetery in Waterville, Maine. Instead of an unmarked grave, Anita is now back with her family. A simple inscription on her tombstone reads, We miss you. Case cracked. I would like to thank ABC7 News, The Kitsap Sun, The Bangor Daily News, The New York Times, The LA Times, findagrave.com, ocsheriff.gov, The Capital Gazette, and The Doe Network. Of course, the biggest thank you goes to Christy Arnhart for researching and writing up today's case, and here she is to discuss it with us now. Well, Christy, today you've brought us a story where if I needed to assemble a real-life Justice League, like a real crew of superheroes, this person would be on that team. Colleen Fitzpatrick, is uh, she's cracked so many cases with genetic genealogy, but outside of that, She is such a caring person. She really cares about uh, education in this sector as well. If I sent her an email today, I know by tomorrow I'd have a response from her, a complete, detailed, thorough response. She is just so friendly, so helpful. I'm really glad that we were able to talk about her in this case. Can you tell us about some other cases that she's cracked? Oh, yeah. I was amazed when I started reading about this woman. She helped solve the Buckskin Girl case. 
she helped to solve uh, Mar- or, excuse me, Lyle Stabick, and we all remember Lyle Stabick. Huge case, yeah. Oh, yes. She helped with lavender dough, and I'm sure we've all heard about lavender dough. Orange socks. I mean, those those are just some of them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you're just scratching the surface there. Um, the list is, is ridiculous, and I'm pretty sure that she's been going nonstop since they've figured out this whole <laughs> DNA genetic <laughs> genealogy component. But... Even a superhero needs help every now and then. And there's this other aspect where it's really about research, um, using tools, online tools that people use for genealogy and kind of connecting the dots between that stuff. Um, And then something special had to happen with this case. Can you tell us about that? Well, there was actually this man named Steve Sabo didn't even know that he was related to Anita. He'd been doing some amateur genealogy work when he was contacted by the Orange County District Attorney's Office, asking for his help in finding out who their Jane Doe was. Well, he then talked to Identifinders and Colleen. Through the family tree he had built on Ancestry.com and the DNA samples he'd filed with the company, he was shown to be a relative, but they didn't know which relative Anita was. That was when he showed them the obituary he had found, and it mentioned a relative who had gone to California and never returned. That turned out to be Anita. Colleen said if it hadn't been for his family detective work, it would have taken them much longer to find her. Think about that. That's that's like a needle in the haystack, In the basically. haystack. Be- I know. Because it's an obituary for someone else in the family and they just happened to mention that there's a family member that went off and disappeared and he had that lightning bolt in his head to connect that piece with the information that they were looking for like can you imagine you've got law enforcement coming to you saying we think that you're related to this case in some way is there somewhere in your family that you know someone disappeared and him because of this footwork he did he recalls a little not even a sentence probably a piece of a sentence from an obituary for someone else interesting Really, really interesting. Um, Now, there was another, there was almost this kind of implied conversation that I detected in the script when we came to this one certain point. And I wanted to flesh it out a little bit. Uh, You mentioned that a doctor had found that Crisco had likely suffered a brain injury. And that kind of raises an interesting question. It actually set me off on a little research path of my own. I know you did some as well. It asks the question of, can an injury of that nature affect your personality in such a way that it could even lead you to criminal actions? So what would you find on that? Well, an article with BigThink.com states, it shows compelling evidence that lesions in one particular brain network can increase the risk of criminal behavior. MRI and CT scans were conducted on convicted criminals. The first group consisted of 17 individuals and linked criminal behavior with brain lesions. But the second, which had 23 volunteers, showed lesions in different areas of the brain. Now, although the lesions inhabited different brain areas, they resided within the same neural networks as those who took part in criminal activity. Volunteers with a criminal past had lesions in the moral decision-making network, which means an injury here increases the likelihood of criminal behavior. That's really interesting and It raises another interesting point. Um, Yes, injuries can create lesions, but I believe some diseases can as well. I don't Uh know if they would affect the same places, but um, yeah. So I went and did some research on this as well. I found this article that was hosted, I think it was over on a a, a law publication. It was actually about like, can can you use this in the courtroom effectively? Mm -hmm. But they were citing a publication called Medical Ethics. And it stated, quote, People with severe brain injury may require close supervision in a controlled environment to prevent violent outbursts and other impulsive behavior. I think Crisco certainly fits into that with the background that we heard about. Um, It's because such people lack the ability to control their impulses and conduct that they may pose a threat to others and themselves. It also continues, uh, criminal responsibility presumes that people have the capacity to, to control their conduct and to choose whether or not to commit crimes. So those whose mental capacity is severely impaired may be found not guilty by reason of insanity for an act that they committed that would otherwise be a crime. So realistically, now, from what I could see, it was kind of a foundation for an argument for using an insanity plea. You know, Mm -hmm. like if you could prove 
This guy, he was in a car accident. He had some type of brain damage. It affected one of those pathways in particular. Um, but the reality of it sounded more like it might be helpful for lessening a sentence or something along those lines. Not necessarily that you would get a full not guilty plea. Um, but they, they talked about a study there as well. Uh, in two classic studies of 15 adults and 14 juveniles on death row in the mid-1980s, psychiatrist Dorothy Lewis found all 29 inmates had a history of traumatic brain injury. Oh. So maybe there's something to it. It's weird. It sounds like <clears throat> they need to start a conversation on this. Yeah. Uh, well, and it's interesting because I don't know if you remember this from the 80s, but there was this trend with writing and popular culture in the 80s about getting hit in the head. And it like, you know, making you have amnesia, like overboard or, yeah. you know, like changing your personality in some big dramatic way. Um, but here we're talking about we're talking about research that's pointing to that. And mm -hmm. it could actually be a factor. Um, so one might assume that their brain injuries for those particular studies that they might have been discovered and taken into consideration during their trials and sentencing. Yet the psychiatrist Lewis reported that evidence of brain injury was not uncovered at all in their trials, much less presented in the legal proceedings. So for those specific 29 people, it, it wasn't used as any part of their defense. Mm, that sounds like numbers that really need to be looked at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or there's some fiction writer out there that needs to, to jump on that because uh, <laughs> I could see like M. Night Shyamalan just running away with that right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I could too. Yeah. I could see a new Stephen King novel. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Christy, thank you so much for all your hard work on today's episode. We really appreciate you. And I've got some other people to thank right now. Thank you, PayPal supporters Sigrid E. O'Hearn, Angela Welch Sola, and Sandy Reed. If you'd like to support the channel, please visit lordandarts.com. There, you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee like Candace recently did. We know that learning about the mechanisms that help support and find justice in these cases is important to understand the many unsolved cases we also cover, and we really appreciate your support in allowing us to continue doing that. Remember, you can get another Lord and Art story every week on the Seriously Mysterious podcast. A new episode is coming tomorrow and every Tuesday after that. Visit SeriouslyMysterious.com and don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcatchers. While you're here, don't forget to hit that bell icon below if you'd like to catch one of our weekly Secret Studio live shows. And of course, I'll be back with a new Unsolved Mystery for you on Friday, right here on the Lord and Arts channel.